Amino acids are a broad group of compounds that are used to assemble what are called proteins. Let's start by taking a look at the general structure of an amino acid. In particular, two amino acids. First of all, the identification of the acid group, the carboxyl group on the right end of the bar molecule, the amino group or amine group on the left end, and two comes from the identification of the location of the attachment point, the R group. That R group can take on a variety of structures. Up to 500 amino acids have been identified, but only 20 of them are essentially used to manufacture proteins. Now, the nature of that R side group affects the properties of our molecule. For instance, if that R group contains carboxylic acids, then it tends to be an acidic uh, amino acid. If, however, it contains nitrogen or amines, then they tend to be basic in nature. An interesting point I should mention here is lysine, the um, amino acid I've shown here on the left, is considered an essential amino acid, meaning we're only capable of getting that amino acid from our diet, in particularly diets that contain cheeses, contain lots of um, lysine. Aspartic acid, on the other hand, we are able to synthesize or make that amino acid ourselves. So essential is reserved for those chemicals which we need to get through our diet. Amino acids are also amphiprotic. We came across this in chapter eight when we looked at uh, the behavior of acids and bases. This particular example shows that the hydrogen can break off our molecule, thereby having the amino acid act as an acid. That unbonded pair of electrons and nitrogen can also accept a proton thereby making it basic. The amino acids, essentially the ones that are used to manufacture proteins, are present in your IV data booklet. Here you can see their common name, their three-letter abbreviation. I should note here they always start the abbreviation with a capitalized letter, their structural formula, and something called their isoelectric pH, which we'll look at a little bit in our next slide. First off, I want to introduce a small problem uh, that puzzled scientists about. Uh, amino acids. First off, we expect hydrogen bonding in these. The presence of the OH group and the NH group would suggest that hydrogen bonding would take place and these would have fairly high melting and boiling points. But their melting and boiling points were actually much higher than those anticipated through hydrogen bonding. What is believed to happen is the hydrogen, with its leaving its electron behind, bonds with the unbonded pair of electrons that are present in nitrogen. This would then result in the formation of a polar molecule, which has complete positive and negative charges at one end and the other. A negative charge exists at the oxygen and a positive charge would exist in the, at the nitrogen. This would allow the molecules to essentially make ionic bonds between each other. And those ionic bonds would be much stronger than hydrogen bonding. And as a result could explain the higher melting and boiling points. This Witter ion that forms tends to be isoelectric, meaning same electric, at one particular pH. In the case of glycine, that pH is 6. So at a pH of 6, it would possess the same number of positive and negative charges. If we change the pH of the solution, we can thereby alter its charge. For instance, if we increase the pH, increasing the pH could be achieved by the addition of OH ions, which would essentially remove the H plus ion to form water. That would leave behind a substance with a negative charge, an anion. Conversely, if I reduce the pH by the introduction of an acid particle, that could then bond at the site of the negative oxygen and thereby leave me with a positively charged substance, a cation. So by altering the pH of our solution, we can alter the behavior of our Zwitter ion, either converting it to an anion or a cation. Um, Amino acids tend to undergo condensation reactions. So here I show an example of glycine combining with phenylalanine. Again, locate the location of the OH and the H group. Those two will join together to essentially produce a water molecule. And then the carbon will extend its bond over to the nitrogen, producing what we call a dipeptide. Now a little bit about the linkage that exists between the two. First of all, you can recognize that as the amide group from functional groups. And the bond that extends from the carbon to the nitrogen is sometimes called an amide linkage or a peptide bond. It's worth noting that reversing the sequence of our amino acids and having them condense produces another substance. These are not isomers of each other. It's an entirely different substance with different properties. Now the word peptide is used to 
to describe the behavior of up to 20 amino acids. Once I extend it beyond 20, 20 to 50 amino acids, I refer to it as a polypeptide. And beyond 50 amino acids, I call the substance a protein. Consider, if you will, the following. If we use 20 amino acids to essentially make a protein, how many possible combinations of amino acids are there to make a protein, which contains, say, 50 units? So you have 20 choices for the first, 20 choices for the second, and so forth. Essentially, it would be 20 to the 50th, or 1.1 times 10 to the 65 possibilities. So that serves as an introduction to our unit on proteins and amino acids. There's two more to follow. Again, comments and questions are always welcome. And thanks for watching.